Welcome everyone, my name is Jack Rico and thank you for downloading episode 21 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. If you're new to our show and you've never heard it, then welcome and here's a quick look at what you can expect from us every single week. Interviews and conversations with top journalists, filmmakers, musicians, authors, and headline newsmakers about their craft, their ideas and perspectives on pop culture, society, and even some politics. A recap of the week's most highly relevant moments on our Jacked In segment, and a personal suggestion on what movies, music, and Broadway shows you should listen to and watch. In essence, we're an Hispanic American podcast that caters to all people who have an interest in the pulse of what's happening in America's pop culture scene. Whether it derives from white, Latino, black, or others, it really doesn't matter. If it's highly relevant to you, it's highly relevant to us. Well, with that said, we have a pretty good show on tap for you this week. We interview the director of the hit bilingual film, Everybody Loves Somebody. Her name is Catalina Aguilar Mastreta, about creating bilingual and bicultural cinema for a new generation of U.S. Hispanics. Also, the Oscars are this Sunday, and who better to talk to about the state of multiculturalism at the Academy Awards than April Rain, the creator of the hashtag OscarSoWhite movement. That plus my review of Jordan Peele's black horror film, Get Out. Movies targeted at U.S. Hispanic viewers rarely do well at the box office, mostly because many of these films stereotype the Latino experience. But Mexican sophomore director Catalina Aguilar Mastreta has defied those stigmas in her new film Everybody Loves Somebody, a bilingual, bicultural romantic comedy that made a surprise $1 million at the box office in only 333 movie theaters. Here, Latinos aren't dishwashers or immigrants. They're doctors with the same shortcomings on love as anyone else. Hello. Oye, no es mexicano. No, but he has a Mexican grandmother named Jacinta. Jacinta, yes, I did. First few times I met the family, I had a Mexican grandmother. Catalina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, congratulations on your box office numbers this past weekend. Uh, It made over $1 million domestically in only 333 theaters. I actually tweeted that out and got over like 800 likes and everybody started retweeting it. Pantaleon, I think Carla... You might have even retweeted it. Yeah, I, I definitely did. And I was sort of taken aback by the amount of love and support on social media. Can you tell me and explain a little bit about why so many people liked this movie? I think there's several reasons. I think in terms of the actual movie, um, the people who like it like it because they connect to it emotionally. Um, I, I really believe that it's a movie that explores just the different ways in which we love each other. And I think those movies... For whatever reason, I mean, you still see it on TV, obviously, but they they, they haven't gotten made as often uh, as they used to. I think we've gone to broader comedies uh, that are pure, pure entertainment or pure laughs. Um, those romantic comedies that sort of explored why relationships relationships happened or how they happened or how we, you know, the way we grew up affects who we fall in love. Like all those questions that I think we all deal with every day. I don't know why they have stopped making movies like that. And this is a little bit like that. So I think on, on that level, it just people emotionally connect to these characters. And they're, my favorite Twitter comment is always when someone's like, you stole my life. How do you know exactly <laughs> what has happened to me? <laughs> it's like, I love that because people are, are really seeing themselves in it. Um, and in terms of why people are, I mean, I, I love that you got such a response for, to your tweet because to me what it says is that people are glad that this, experiment works why do you call this an experiment well because it is a strange movie like when when i look at it i feel like um i was very worried that we were alienating our audience in a sense um and that this idea of being truly bilingual and truly bicultural and not calling attention to it and not like you know letting our audience know that this is the movie that they were going to see in many ways um was going to put people off and quite the opposite so i think um that's exciting. To me, it's certainly exciting to know that people are craving seeing themselves on screen. And people who don't look like our characters and don't live like our characters are enjoying seeing this experience portrayed. 
Right. Now, who is the audience that you were initially and originally targeting? Was that uh, a white America or was that Mexican Americans or, or Mexicans? Well, I think originally, originally, this is a Mexican movie. So we wanted it to do well in Mexico, which it has. So we're, we're happy about that. But to me personally, the audience I was seeking was people like me and people... Um, Describe a little bit about you. You uh, yeah, were people born who in are Mexico, right? Yeah, I was born in Mexico and I have been in Los Angeles for the past eight years. And I, of course, just grew up very uh, affected by American culture and fairly bilingual, even in Mexico. And I know that's not that, that common, but to me, people like Carla, who was born in Mexico City, but then came to the United States when she was two, and then came back when she was about 14, and has truly had two homes her entire life. Right. And that is true of me now. Um, and then people like Chema Jaspic, our, lead, our leading guy, who actually grew up in Tijuana, but went to school in San Diego, so he literally crossed every day. So those experiences that feel anecdotal in a way aren't. I feel like, you know, we are neighbors and this idea of um, Mexicans that have both cultures, both languages, both homes at the same time, either literally or through their parents, through their family, it's a wide you know, it's a, it's a wide experience. So there's a lot of people that are craving seeing that. No solamente creo eso, sino que creo que también el colombiano, el uh, Claro, el cualquier tipo de migrante, de algún modo. Porque la otra, esa es la otra cosa que siempre digo y se ríen de mí. Ayer Rap tuvo un, un headline que era Everybody loves somebody is going to teach all Jewish men how to love. <laughs> Because I always say that I grew up watching Woody Allen films and Rob Reiner films. Um, and those are, those are like the old Jewish men. But Nora Ephraim films was not a Jewish male, but who also shouldn't have necessarily spoken to me the way she did. Um, like on at face value, your experiences were very different. Now, this is your second film. Este, esta película la escribiste, la dirigiste. Explícame exactamente cómo este proyecto eh, se originó. Eh, es una película que empecé a escribir hace mucho tiempo, cuando estaba todavía, eh, yo estudié en el American Film Institute en Los Ángeles, guionismo. Y antes de hacer mi primera película, escribí este guión como parte de, de mi maestría. Ah. Y nunca pensé que se fuera a hacer. Sí, 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 es un, es, es un guión en eso eh, viejo. Y mmm, nunca pensé que se fuera a hacer. Y luego Francisco González Compeán, el productor de la película, me preguntó que si tenía eh, una comedia romántica, porque en México las comedias románticas estaban teniendo éxito. Y le mandé esta, pero obviamente sabía que lo quería hacer en México como una producción mexicana. Entonces, original, original, originalmente la historia pasaba entre Los Ángeles y Ojai, los papás hippies que ahora vemos que viven en Ensenada vivían en Ojai. Y era una historia de gente que vivía en Los Ángeles. Eh, y a la hora que la pasamos a hacer una producción mexicana, dije, ah, pues por supuesto que sí, cambiemos a la familia de Vida Ensenada, le, le cambiamos el apellido y que hable en español, y ya, hasta ahí llegó mi, mi thought process, de alguna manera. Right, right, right. Porque era tan, tan fácil de traducir, las emociones eran tan universales, que de alguna manera dije, pues volvamos a la familia mexicana, o sea, no, ni, ni me lo pregunté. Y de pronto eso es lo que se volvió el gran comentario y es, y es uh, con, con la película terminada de lo que estamos más orgullosos. Now, did everyone involved in the production think that this bilingual film was going to work or did anyone tell you this is not going to work, Catalina? Let's do a movie exclusively for Spanish speakers or English language Americans, but you can't have both. You know, not really. To, to, the, to everyone's credit, to the producer's credit, that was kind of what made the story organic that that she was from los angeles and that i think it's also what spoke to carla uh that this was you know an opportunity for her to explore as she said both her personalities um so i, I think we always knew that that's what made it special uh whether mm -hmm. it was going to work or not that was a different um conversation yeah so but at the same time we think, i think it was very natural on set uh and even doing casting for for the for the English speaking roles, it just felt very easy and very like the way we relate to one another. Um, so it, it, as long as we kept it natural and organic, we always knew that it was somehow going to work because we weren't forcing anything. We weren't trying to make a bilingual film. We were just telling the story of the characters who live in Los Angeles, therefore they speak English and then go to their parents' house, and they speak Spanish with them. Like, it just felt very like the way life is. Right. Now, let me ask you this, because this is very interesting to me. So many marketers, so many Hispanic marketers, and so many advertisers, and basically everybody's trying to reach the Hispanic 
uh, audience. But they understand that the Hispanic audience is also a Hispanic American audience, almost like an evolution of what you and I remember of our parents being. And yeah. so little by little, I'm noticing that film is taking sort of the lead on creating that bilingual, bicultural universe, but television hasn't. Un ejemplo, las novelas. Cada vez que yeah. hay una novela, la novela siempre se siente mexicana. De pronto, hay unas novelas que tienen una vibra un poco más americana. Pero ¿por qué crees tú que la televisión aún no ha adaptado ese mundo bicultural y bilingüe? Pues mira, esa es la pregunta que se hace todo el mundo. Eh, creo que específicamente con las novelas se sabe que el público que las ve es un público más grande y cuando tienen un público más joven es porque la ven con sus papás. Entonces, en ese sentido... Eh, es una cosa casi de nostalgia, ¿no? O sea, la, la comunidad que ve telenovelas aquí la ve porque la veía de niña en México y tiene esa cosa de, de, de tradición. Entonces, quizá de ahí viene que no tenga lógica hacerlas en inglés, incluso cuando pasan en Miami o, o en ciudades en Estados Unidos. Pero de nuevo, me imagino, creo que, que, que el mercado latino es para empezar un contingente muy diverso, que es difícil de abarcar. Uh -huh. Y es por eso que ha sido difícil crear productos para nosotros, pero al mismo tiempo en general como comunidad estamos mal representados el, el porcentaje que representamos en nuestra sociedad no está representada en prácticamente ninguno de los ámbitos de nuestra sociedad no estamos representados en la política, en los porcentajes no existimos como comunidad, no estamos representados en los medios, tampoco no estamos representados en los deportes, Correcto. en general somos una comunidad que está unrepresented. Entonces, y fracturada a la misma vez. Exactamente. Y es, de alguna manera, creo que el, que el éxito de, de, de nuestra gabalinización tiene que venir, sobre todo cultural, tiene que venir del modo que han venido el de otras eh, minorías, que es encontrar la manera de que alguien gane dinero con hacer productos culturales para nuestra, para nuestra comunidad. Os deseo, pero creo que eso es, es, ese es el, la llave. Y creo que eso es lo que estamos tratando de hacer, están haciendo productos que la comunidad se sienta orgullosa de ellos y quiera ir a verse en la pantalla. ¿no? That's true, that's true. And, and that's what I like about it. But you were talking a little bit about flow, about the way the movie just seemed to flow properly. Uh, tenías las mujeres eran latinas, los novios de las mujeres eran americanos, o judíos, <laughs> o australianos, etc. Uh, hablaban en español, después hablaban en inglés. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about how you managed to establish that flow? Uh, well, I think a lot of it was casting in the sense that we needed people that, that understood this and could very easily move back and forth. Not just between languages, but just between cultures and, and almost like ideas of what life should be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the idea that the sister should be married to an American was important to me in the sense that I wanted to have the, the, the Bobby character, their child, mm -hmm. be the ultimate representation of what this is. Oh my and God, like, he is. Turn to her aunt <laughs> and talk in Spanish for a second and then move and talk in English and you know have the mom speak Spanish to him, but then him answering in English. I mean, I wanted that character and I wanted to represent this sort of bicultural marriage. Um, and at the same time, I think the the, the triangle that our leading lady is, is involved in, I thought was more interesting if it was between her Mexican boyfriend who was part of her family and who felt like this familiar place, like her parents' house almost. Right, her um, past and then someone meets who, the future. Yeah, her past. And someone who, who felt completely out of place in, in her life. So the fact that he was Australian, I, I loved. And that was, again, uh, an accident of casting, a, a happy accident of casting. That this guy came in and they had such good chemistry and I was like, this makes it weirder and that's great. And do you think this is like the future of movies in Hollywood moving forward? Hopefully the future is all kinds of people showing on screen all kinds of experiences and then we can all finally understand the very evident truth that, you know, we all experience things in the same way. I mean, stories are meant to teach us empathy and to put us in someone else's shoes. Um, and the more diverse we can make that experience of empathy, then, you know, we will lose that fear of the other that is certainly plaguing us right now. Um, so I, I definitely think this movie will, will appeal to white Americans, to African Americans, because it's about emotions and it's about overbearing parents and it's about trying to figure <laughs> out your life and, and growing up. And that's, you know, those are all universal experiences. And the language thing, can be a little annoying. I think we've had some comments of people who saw the poster uh, and didn't realize that the movie was a little bit in Spanish. Um, so they were like struggling through the subtitles at the beginning and they're like, oh, is this whole movie going to be in Spanish? 
And then when the English came in, they were like, oh, okay. And sort of stayed with the experience and then came out liking it. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we know that, that it speaks to all kinds of audiences because in the end, it's just an honest portrayal of, of how confusing love is. And we can all relate to that. And the final question is a lot of people have already been asking, it, will there be a national rollout of the film that way more people in more cities can see it? Well, we are um, in cities all over America, and I think our distributor usually handles this sized movie. So I don't, I don't think we're going to go wider than we are right now. Um, but hopefully the, the theaters shift so some people that don't have a theater close to them can find it. Well, listen, Catalina, I wish you the best of luck. I'm so happy for you, for the cast, uh, for this type of genre of movie. Uh, I think it's the future. I think it's a great representation of Hispanic American, what America is at the end of the day, which is this mixture of of yeah. cultures and ethnicities and different skin colors and different languages. No, thank you. You can catch Catalina's new bicultural bilingual romantic comedy, Everybody Loves Somebody, in theaters right now. Catalina, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Have a good one. It's time for Jacked In. Let's begin with the top movie news of the week. Ben Affleck will no longer be directing The Batman. That job will now belong to Matt Reeves, who has directed Cloverfield and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Speaking of Batman, a Robin movie called Nightwing will be getting the big screen treatment. Chris McKay from The Lego Movie will direct. No word on who will be playing Robin. James Earl Jones and Donald Glover's voices will be joining the live-action remake of Disney's The Lion King. Changing over to the small screen, Fox's hit show Empire has cast Demi Moore for a multiple-episode role for season three. And comedian Conan O'Brien will be doing his late-night show South of the Border in Mexico City with the help of an all-Mexican staff, crew, and studio audience. It'll be called Conan Without Borders, Made in Mexico, which is set to air March 1st on TBS. Diego Luna and former Mexican president Vicente Fox are two of the people confirmed. Conan gave some details on the show on a Televisa morning show. What would it be on your show? Okay, well, yesterday... Is it one program? We're going to shoot, yes, it's going to be one program. Mm -hmm. What the shame is that I think we could shoot 10 here. It's immediately apparent that... Diego Luna is going to be a guest on the show. Great guy. Uh, Vicente Fox is coming on the How show. How do you pick Vicente Fox? Uh, mm-hmm. Vicente Fox, we just thought he's very outspoken. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, yes. He has very colorful language. He's not afraid to speak his mind, and we thought it might mm-hmm. be interesting to have a quick interview with him mm-hmm. and uh, get him to say effing wall at least three times. Switching to music. <laughs> Mexican-American pop star Becky G will be releasing her first ever Spanish-language album very soon, but the first single of the album, Todo Cambio, a pop urban track, will be coming out next month. Cuban-American singer Camila Bello, formerly of Fifth Harmony, is teaming up with Jay Balvin and Pitbull for a track on the new Fate and Furious soundtrack called Hey Ma, releasing in April. And finally, in Broadway news, Guatemalan actor Oscar Isaac and Keegan-Michael Key are going to be teaming up to do Hamlet at the Public Theater in New York on June 20th. Don't miss it. Joining me on the podcast today to talk about this year's Academy Awards is April Rain, creator of the Oscar So White hashtag and one of the more influential persons uh, that talks about race and culture in the film industry. April, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. So I want to get your initial thoughts on this year's Academy Awards. I mean, ever since you introduced Oscar So White back in uh, January of 2015, a lot has happened. Tell me um, a little bit about how, I guess, your perspective as an observer of having launched that hashtag. Just, you know, words put together on Twitter. And then to see it take off the way it has and the impact that it's done for change, for good change, uh, up to this day leading up to this Sunday's Oscar Awards. It's been an amazing ride, just one that I could never have predicted. Um, you know, no one ever knows when a hashtag or something they say on Twitter or any social media platform is going to go viral. 
And here we are still talking about this over two years later. Uh, so what we've seen in the two years since I created the hashtag with the very first tweet, which was Oscar so white may ask to touch my hair, um, <laughs> is, is, um, so is incremental progress, you know, so we're probably in a better place than we were uh, two years ago, but there's still a long way to go. So this is definitely a marathon and not a sprint. Uh, so what we've seen this year is we had a significant number of black filmmakers, both in front of and behind the camera that have been nominated this year. Um, and I'm happy for that because it means that more folks have had opportunities um, but it, what we also see is that other marginalized communities have been lagging behind and some even moving backward, in my opinion. So, um, you know, Oscar So White is about all marginalized communities. So that's race, gender, sexual orientation, the disabled community, the First Nations folks, um, you know, and, and specifics too. So in the nearly 90 year history of the Academy, uh, we've only seen four women directors and uh, nominated and only one has won. So Oscar So White is about that too. Right. Um, and, and so while we have seen um, an influx of films that reflect the black experience this year, you know, in 2017, I'm still waiting for a rom-com, a romantic comedy from the LGBTQIA community, you know, and, and why are we still talking about? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's one that I'm shocked that we haven't seen it yet. Right. right. You know, and, and it's way past time. Now, Chris Rock last year, and this is one of the issues that I had with him hosting is that, he made his monologue about race in Hollywood exclusively a binary one. I mean, like, Latinos, who are the largest minority in this country, felt completely excluded from this and the larger conversation on race in America. You know, I feel like he had an opportunity to bring all of us together, and he just squandered it. Now, how much have you had to explain that Oscar So White and that the problems assailing Hollywood are not just a black issue— but inclusive of everyone else. Right. It's, it's an ongoing problem. Um, you know, I, I was a bit disappointed, to be honest with you, with Chris Rock's um, monologue and some of the sketches that they did because it wasn't, was not only... It was not the inclusive. Latinx, right. Not at all. Um, and it wasn't just the Latinx community that felt um, slighted, but the Asian American Pacific Islander community as well. You know, if you recall those skits with the little, the little kids playing the accountants and it, you know, it was, it was a bit offensive there Yeah, as I well. do remember that. Um, and, and so I got a lot of pushback that night from the Asian American Pacific Islander community saying, you know, why haven't you been sticking up for us too? And uh, as if I had had anything to do <laughs> with Chris Rock's monologue. Or but you've Oscars become the face said, for that movement for, I guess, right, Oscar right. So White and, is and really so a minority like, movement. Well, it's, it's a marginalized community um, movement. So, you know, I don't like to use the term minority because, as you rightfully p p uh, pointed out, the largest growing population in this country is the Latinx community. And we also see that with respect to purchasing power as well. So black and Latino specifically and Asian Americans, if you add those three groups oh in God. together, Huge. we are the majority with respect to theater goers. So I don't like to use minority. I like to use, you know, underrepresented communities when talking about um, our groups. Now, again, Oscar So White is about sexual orientation and, and gender and so on. Um, but I, I spend a lot of my time um, fighting back on the issue that this is not just a black and white thing. And I don't know if that's because I'm a black woman and Chris Rock was a black man. And, it, you know, and obviously, you know, with enslavement and, and what's going on and, and, and what has gone on in this country, um, you know, people automatically think black versus white just because yeah. of our storied history. Um, but I would hope, I would love to broaden the conversation. Um, let's talk a little bit about progress. How much progress can you then encapsulate into the moment that you introduced Oscar So White up to now? Are you satisfied uh, with the amount of progress that has been done? And if there's more progress to, to have, how much more do we have to? How long will this conversation, do you think, take? Right. I'm definitely not satisfied, you know, and, and for uh, several reasons. One, you know, one good year of movies that reflect the black experience does not make up for nearly 90 years of underrepresentation just for black folks. 
Um, and again, we're still waiting to see so many other marginalized communities. You know, we black folks are, are not a monolith for all races or all marginalized communities. So we even see a step was taken back in 2016 and going into 2017 for the Asian American Pacific Islander community. So movies like um, Ghost in the Shell with Scarlett Johansson coming out this year and, and The Great Wall with Matt Damon, um, in which the Asian American or Asian culture was appropriate inappropriately um, in these movies is actually a slap in the face to the AAPI community. So, so the work for me continues because until everyone can go into a theater and pay their hard-earned dollars and see themselves represented on the screen, not just, you know, during award season, but in the middle of March or in the middle of any other month of the year, then we still need to have this conversation about diversity and inclusion. Um, I also want to make very clear that, you know, all of the movies that are nominated this year that reflect the black experience were in production or pre-production before January 2015 when the hashtag was created. So I don't take credit for any of that. You know, Moonlight and Hidden Figures and Fences and some of the other movies would have been fantastic had they been made in 1996 or 2016. <laughs> right, right, right. Which is, you know, one of the things that, that I keep on telling my Latino community brothers where I go, guys, we barely made any movies that, that merited that. So you also kind of got to make the movies, and it speaks to a whole deeper conversation about not necessarily nominations and award shows and whether we're represented uh, appropriately or not. This is really about being given the opportunity to tell our stories from wherever you may be. And I think that's the problem, is that it's been a struggle with Hispanics to even make these movies to then be considered for uh, Oscar awards. Finally, I did want to ask you this. What advice do you have for media, film bloggers, film critics uh, that are diverse? What do, you, what do you have to say to them? How much more do we have to do as a, as a community uh, to be able to influence and be able to support also you in this process of diversifying Hollywood a lot more? I would say use the platform that you had, that you have. Um, you know, I, I had no specific entree into the movie industry. Uh, you know, I was a person who was fed up with what she was seeing on TV and year after year with the Oscars. And I used my platform and, and some changes have been made. There's nothing to say that there's nothing special about me. There's, there's nothing to say that anybody else can't do the exact same thing. I think it's important for, you know, film critics obviously make a difference, a significant difference. You know, you say that you don't like a particular movie. There are going to be some people that don't go see that movie just based on a particular review. Right. So it is incumbent, it's incumbent upon, um, um, film critics of color and other marginalized communities to support quality films. Now, let me be clear, do not reward mediocrity. You know, let's not go see films just because it has a wholeheartedly Latinx agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Because that makes a difference too. But when you do see a film that you like, whether you're a professional film critic or just a theater goer, Talk it up, you know, take a friend with you, talk it up on social media um, and, you know, speak out about that film. Also, there are two other things. Go to the smaller movie houses. So perhaps bypass, you know, the huge megaplex with 24 screens because sometimes the best movies and the movies that don't get wide release are in those smaller houses. So you're not only supporting that maybe independent and local business, but you're also supporting those films that reflect um, marginalized communities that you may not see on the big screen. Lastly, I would say support film festivals, especially smaller ones, because a lot, you know, there are movies being made from the Latinx experience and the disabled experience and so on, but they don't see the light of day because they don't receive the type of support that they should. A lot of these film festivals I are agree. relatively ex in inexpensive. You go out there, you support it, and then you go back and you talk it up on social media. They may get a shot that they would not have otherwise. Uh, April, so are you headed out to the Oscars uh, for this Sunday? Are you getting the red carpet treatment from the Academy? Academy. <laughs> you know, in, in two years now, I have never heard from the Academy at all. Interesting. Um, so Not even a sit down to there. talk a, lot of, a little bit more about what you're doing, huh? Not even an email. I'm and I shocked. think part of that is, 
Uh, well, okay. <laughs> I think part of that is is that the academy wants to be seen as having made these changes on their own and don't want to say that they're actually caving to public pressure. Yeah, sure, so because they came up with it way before uh, you came out with Oscar So White, as opposed well, the, the to all time, these changes the timing having... Is coincidental. <laughs> <laughs> the timing is coincidental. But I will be in L.A. and I will be, um, I will be live tweeting the Oscars for OK Player on Twitter. Uh, and I will also be doing some live segments on BBC World TV on Sunday night. Well, so we're going to be in. watching, we're going to be supporting, and we'll be interacting with you. So thank you so much, April, for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you. Before we head on to our review of Jordan Peele's horror film, Get Out, here's a listen to the tracks I've been obsessing about this week. Manuel Medrano, La Mujer Que Bota Fuego. I'm only coming out to play Nothing more that I hate in this life Anderson Pack, am I wrong? I only have one to make You can open your palm, waiting to catch a break Se abren las ventanas Y el sol de la mañana comienza a iluminar Donde había oscuridad Camila Luna, despierto Amor en artefacto me eleva sin ver Y me empiezo a enamorar Despierto Que las nubes están marchando Y los pajaritos cantan Que lo llevo en Jordan Peele's unique new thriller about an African-American photographer whose Caucasian girlfriend's parents hide a sinister and twisted secret is genre-changing. Do they know I'm black? Should they? You might wanna, you know? Mom and Dad, my black boyfriend will be coming up this weekend. I just don't want you to be shocked that he's a black man. <laughs> I ain't never seen you like this before, bro. Meeting family, taking road trips, don't come back all bougie, man. Peel has managed to integrate slick humor in all the thrills and scares that come with a thriller, but with the element of racial tension that pushes the genre forward. So look, I go do my research. Apparently, a whole bunch of brothers been missing in this suburb. But it's cool. Bro, how you not scared of this, man? Apart from the dimension of social commentary, it also breaks genre protocols by making the protagonist smart and logical as opposed to dumb and predictable. Get Out continues the rise of great black storytelling in cinema, and it's arguably the most singular thing you'll see so far in 2017. No, 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 And that's how we finish it, folks. Thank you for listening to the 21st episode of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I want to thank Catalina Aguilar Mastreta and April Rain for also joining me on the podcast this week. I hope you guys liked it. And if you want to reach out, I'm on Twitter. Go ahead and uh, look me up at Jack Rico Official. Also, please subscribe and leave a review. We're now on Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher. We're basically on all of them. See you again next Friday on another episode of Highly Relevant. Thank you.